This is Chris Hogan, and you are listening to the Earn and Invest Podcast. You've always had it easy, he whispered. And then he said it again. You've always had it easy. And in some ways, I couldn't argue with him. I was born to the right family. We were middle class. I got the right education and went to a good university. And then I became a doctor. I couldn't argue with his sentiment. And yet, he wasn't there when I was working the 100-hour work weeks. He wasn't there on Saturday morning when I was going to the library while everyone else was going to the football game. And he wasn't there during residency when I moonlighted three to four nights a week, sometimes staying up 40 hours in a row to work so that I had enough money to afford a down payment on a house. There is no question that there are some extraordinary millionaires in the United States, people who were born to the right place at the right time, got the right education, and eventually had the right jobs. But more intriguing is this question, are there normal, average, everyday millionaires? And better yet, are they the exception or are they the rule? You know what is one of the most difficult things when you finally decide to get your finances in order? Where do you go to get all the information? I mean, you can be overwhelmed with all the blogs, news sites, YouTube videos, podcasts. I know I certainly was overwhelmed, and that's why my friend Jim Wang created WalletHacks.com. It is a one-stop shop for you to learn about credit cards, banking, investing, insurance, loans, pretty much anything you could want to know about money, it's there, and it's one stop. In fact, recently he put up an article on TransferWise questioning whether it's a legit way to send money internationally. I know I've occasionally had to send money out of the country, and I've always wondered what's the best way to do it, what's the most cheap way, and how do I know I'm not going to lose that money? These are the kind of questions you can get answered at WalletHacks.com. Jim created it pretty much just to demystify money. For far too long, experts have made it complicated so they can make money off you. WalletHacks offers no products, no services, just information to help you become better at your money, and best of all... It's free. Check it out at wallethacks.com. That's W A L L E T H A C K S.com. And don't forget to sign up for their free newsletter. Chris Hogan is the best selling author of Retire Inspired and Everyday Millionaires. He is a personal finance expert and America's leading voice on retirement, investing, and building wealth. His podcast, The Chris Hogan Show, has millions of downloads. Chris, welcome to Earn and Invest. Well, thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be with you. As I was reading your book, Everyday Millionaires, it dawned on me that if your career had taken a different path, we might be still having this interview today, but I might have been in hot water because you would have been an FBI agent. (laughs) Yeah, at one point, that was definitely my goal. I think I had decided in seventh grade that was going to be my career path. And I've been goal-oriented since birth, I think. But having that mindset, moving in that direction. But thankfully, I get a chance to help protect and serve in a different way on the financial side instead of on the law enforcement side. So tell me, however, did you go from FBI agent to personal finance expert and working with Dave Ramsey? Yeah, it's well, it was a it was a crazy journey. After I finished grad school, uh, I got my master's degree and was still thinking about the bureau, but started moving down that path and just began to understand and see more of that lifestyle, how restrictive it was from a family man like myself. And so just beginning to just wake up and see it and thinking differently. So I pivoted and went into the business route, which led to into banking, which then led me to eventually crossing paths with Dave Ramsey at a uh, charity event and getting a chance to connect with him, sitting in on the show, getting to know more about him. We established a friendship. And next thing you know, I've I've been with him for 15 years and it's been a, a fantastic journey. Incidentally, I just recorded a show with a bunch of athletes and ex-athletes and talking to them about how athletics changed their trajectory into personal finance. 
you were a football player in college. Some of those lessons you learned as a football player really helped in the personal finance world, I imagine. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I think as you begin to understand the importance of goal setting, the importance of sacrifice, the goal of investing, you know, because as you're lifting weights and training, you're investing in your body to be able to perform on game day. And so all of those aspects, teamwork, where you understand the importance of being able to work with other professionals, CPAs, investment professionals, you, you, state planning attorneys, you need the right people around you to be able to guide you. I want to jump right into your book, Everyday Millionaires. And part of the reason that I was really excited to read it is I am a big fan of The Millionaire Next Door by mm. Stanley and Danko. So I read that at the beginning of my personal finance journey. Tell me how that book influenced your decision to both study these 10,000 millionaires and to write this book. Well, obviously, it had a profound impact. You know, being able to read that book, uh, I think it came out in 1996, being able to read that and see this information uh, where you understand the reality, you know, there's what society shows you and then there's the reality. And, you know, digging in and back then they studied around 800 people, uh, which was amazing because they did everything via mail. Right. So the fact that they pulled that off was unbelievable. And so I was doing a media hit and I was on a panel and a gentleman that was at the end made this statement, which started the fire. He said, the American dream is dead and gone. It's not possible to build wealth anymore. And so people just need to come to terms with that, right? And we went to commercial break and I wanted to go over and just grab him and not in a, in a happy way <laughs> because it, Doc, in my mind, there was a single mom, there was a, a millennial couple, single dad sitting there listening to this thinking it's not possible for them anymore. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, as a coach, my job is to educate, encourage and empower people. This kind of message wasn't going to encourage people. It was going to really defeat them. So I set out to do a study to prove it, to get the real facts, to help people understand what's possible and what's not. When I think of the Stanley and Danko book, one saying comes to mind, all hat, no cattle. This idea that people play a big game, they spend a lot of money, but when you look at their net worth, there isn't much there. You guys studied 10,000 millionaires. How did you find them? First and foremost, you're absolutely right. That that big hat, no cattle thing. I've heard that down in Texas a lot, and that's real down there. But I, I, you know, we first started off. I reached out to the people that are in my tribe, people that are connected, following me. We reached out to people that are connected, following Dave. But we just we still weren't at a number. We wanted to do something that made a statement. So we ended up reaching out to a research firm to help us locate these millionaires because I didn't want them from just one region. I wanted them from all around the country. And so all states are represented to be able to see this, but it got that big and it, it was a heck of an undertaking and a massive amount of research. One of the masterful things about the book is how you debunk the myths about wealth in America. Let's look at the biggest first myth. The book is subtitled, How Ordinary People Build Extraordinary Wealth. Can anyone be a millionaire today? I'm going to tell you, Doc, I firmly believe without a shadow of a doubt, based on the things that I've seen in my lifetime, what I've lived, and at the same time, people that have overcome some serious challenges, it is without a doubt possible. We live in the, on the greatest country on the planet. I'm biased. This is the only one I've lived in. But the bottom line is, is you can have a dream and decide within the same minute and start to do it, right? I talk about in the book, Permission Slips. We all remember those back in grade school and, and middle school where you couldn't go on a field trip unless your parents or guardian signed this permission slip. Well, I firmly believe that as adults, we get to sign our own permission slip. We get to get, give ourselves an opportunity to be able to grow forward and to push and to chase down what matters to us. And so I want to get people to, to really challenge what they believe is possible for themselves. People can put on a front, like you said, with looking like they have money and they don't. People can also put on a front acting like they believe they can and they truly don't. So I want them to dig in deep and get serious and real with yourself about what you believe and why, and then make a decision and pursue that path. As you're answering that question, it really brings up in my mind this idea of the contradictory mythology of the United States. We have the American dream, which says that everyone can make it. And on the other hand, we have all these myths about how only the rich can become richer, only the rich can be millionaires. Let's talk about those myths generally. 
who do they serve? Why has this mythology built up that it's impossible to become a millionaire? Who is pushing this myth on America and who does it serve? Well, I can tell you this, right? right I mean, being extremely direct, it's easier. It's easier to believe that myth because what it does is gives you now an excuse to not have to do anything different, to not have to strive or to try. But you can blame and you can have, it's almost like this victim mentality, right? Where we're looking and we go, well, you know what? Little man can't get ahead, but these people did because they came from wealth or, you know, and that was one of the big myths. Everyone believes, you know, that, 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 that all wealthy people, it was handed to them. Right. They didn't do anything for it. They just were in the lucky DNA club. And uh, the reality is, is that's not true. You know, these you have almost, you know, 78 percent of these millionaires didn't inherit a dime. Right. And so these were first generation people that built wealth over time. But I think it's an excuse because if I can say, well, I didn't come from a family of money, so it's not meant for me. It kind of gives people an opportunity to resign mentally and give up. Talk to us about some of those other myths. You mentioned one of the big myths is that wealth is handed to millionaires. What are some of the other big ones that you talk about in the book? Well, uh, other big ones, uh, you know, that you have to go to a fancy school, right? We've heard this educational lie for so long and depends on the career. You can go to school and get a higher education. But 62% of the millionaires that we studied went to a public state university, right? 8% went to a community college and 9% didn't go to college at all. And so the myth that you have to go to a fancy school, that's not true. Another one that you have to have a big income, right? You have to have a massive six-figure income. Not true. A third of the millionaires that we studied didn't have a combined household income of six figures. A combined. That meant two of them were working outside of the home And together, they didn't make six figures. So it's not that you have to go to a fancy school. It's not that you have to have a high level of education. What you need is the desire, a plan, and the ability to invest over time. I want to talk more about the solutions in a minute. But you know what really blew my mind was your data about inheritance. Certainly, I know when you see a wealthy person out there in the world, one of the first thoughts is, oh, they inherited it from a family member. That's not the case. No, it's really not. And a lot of people, I think, uh, in looking back at it, of the people that did inherit, it wasn't enough that would have caused them to become millionaires. And so it's just easier, I think. I mean, I think about myself. I came from a lower middle class family in Kentucky. And, you know, if you asked me back then what I thought a millionaire was, I would have pointed to an actor, an actress, movie star, or musician, right? That you had to do one of those things. I didn't understand, Right. But as you dig into this and you start to look at these careers, you know, the top three careers of these millionaires, number one, you know, were accountants. Right. And that doesn't surprise because they count stuff and then engineers. (laughs) Right. These people plan. I was like, okay, number three blew me away. Teachers, college professors and teachers. This is the most undervalued, underpaid profession on the planet, right? But they're looking and you think about it. What they did was is they invested consistently in their 403B. They got intentional about getting themselves out of debt. So they pay off their home, right? And then they've got a 500000 or so in their 403B. And so I'm looking at their net worth going, hey, it is possible. Yeah, and it certainly points to the fact of the slow and steady route, especially when you talk about the 401k or 403b. These are not people who are hitting it big in year one or year two of working. These are people who are consistently putting their money away over time. Doc G, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's another thing that people tend to think is that you have to take big risk, right? You 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 got to jump on the Bitcoin or the whatever other <laughs> cryptic <laughs> crap they come up with that's not realistic. And no, they don't take extreme risks. These are people that are intentional over time looking at this. And you're right, that's slow and steady. It's that tortoise will beat the hare every time because the hare gets distracted. And that's what we can't do. I think we have so many things going on right now. Now, listen, we've got real challenges going on right now with all the pandemic and things that are going on, but us reminding ourselves to control what we can control. And I call that controlling the controllables and really being intentional. And we can't wait on anybody in the White House to save the day. We have to get our own cape. And that's us having a plan as well as a purpose. Before we get to some of the solutions you suggest in Everyday Millionaires, were you surprised when you started looking at the mythology to find out that most of it wasn't true? Like when you were in that midpoint in your writing and you got all the data together and saw that all these myths just 
aren't true. Did it surprise you? It did surprise me. I would have thought the inheritance would have been higher. I would have thought the income would have been higher and that you probably, there was more people that went to Ivy League elitist type schools. And so, you know, looking at this, it really was as I started to comb through it, look, and I go, these are people that you literally could be living next door to, working with. They're not flashy. They're not leaning against, a, 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 a you know, a Bentley in front of a 42,000 square foot home in a flashy suit. These are people that are hardworking, that are focused, that are really intentional on making a legacy. And it's just one of those things where it just made me be grateful and appreciative of the opportunity we have in this country, that we don't need anyone's permission. What we need is a desire and the effort. Let's talk solutions some more. You spend a good deal of time talking about responsibility. Do you feel there's a crisis of responsibility in America today? Without a shadow of a doubt. I think there's not only a crisis, I think it is almost to epidemic proportions where we look to blame someone else for what we don't have. And and, and it's one of those things where it is really designed to try to shame or belittle someone that's worked hard. I, I don't know how we can get behind a sports team that wins a trophy and we're happy for them, but you have someone else that reaches a milestone or makes some progress. And now instead of being appreciative and excited for them, we have to internalize and now it becomes about us. And so that's where you have the hate and the jealousy that stems. And so, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. I, I think you're always going to have a level of people that are at that standpoint of hating or being jealous. You know, there's a drink for haters. It's called Haterade, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to. But at the flip side, they can also make a change for themselves. Now, I am not saying that people don't have different start points because we do. Some people have better start points or whatever than others. What I'm saying is, is we're running the same race, right? And so you're on your own clock. You're not on someone else's clock. So run your race, right? Don't, don't become a, 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 just a person watching. Be a part of it and run it for you and your family. What I found myself talking about, because I do a lot of talking about financial independence, and I think in some ways it also looks similar when you're talking about the million goal, is because people start at such different places. I can't promise that you'll get to financial independence. I can't per se promise you'll get to a million dollars. But what I can promise is we can help you get to a much better place. That's great. I like that. Here's the thing. Even as a coach, I coached football when I was going to grad school. You know, I I could tell people, listen, I can give you the skill set. I can help you prepare. What I can't give you is the heart. Like, I I can't make you do it. Like, I can have you run sprints. I can get you stronger. I can do all these things as a strength coach. Even as an academic monitor, I can make you go to class, right? I can walk you there. And I did that with some of the guys back in the day. But I can't make you really study. And I think that's where you have to provide the want to. And, you know, I, 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 I leave it in people's corner. I'm like, listen, I want to give you the information. I want to give you the tools, but you have to do the building. And ultimately, that's the responsibility side. You know, the other factor that I talk about in the solutions part of the book is intentionality, meaning they happen to life. 97% of the millionaires we study say they feel that they control their own destiny. 97%. When we looked at the general population, it was closer to 52%. And so these millionaires are wired differently. They're looking at things going, no, 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 I'm going to control the controllables. And they're going to happen to life instead of letting it happen to them. Do you think too much of the population is looking for an easy button? Are they looking to get there too fast? Yeah, absolutely they are. Listen, we got microwaves and super waves. <laughs> like you can zap rice in a minute. You kidding me? I grew up in the, in, you know, as a child in the 70s, you had to let that thing boil for like nine hours before you could make it, <laughs> right? So we're so used to zapping stuff. And I'll never forget when that easy button came on. You know, I thought we, people are living life like this. Like they want to hit it and just be there. But think about our parents, you know, the people that grew up in the 40s or the 50s and 60s. They worked their tails off for 20 to 25 years to get to where they are. And automatically now we want to be there in 20 and 25 minutes. It's not realistic. And unmanaged expectations, I three creates more misery, more, more depression right now in our society than anything else. I don't know why we think we can get there in in like three minutes when it's going to take time. And when you're talking about that time, especially when you're talking about 20, 25 years, which often is what it takes someone to become a 401k millionaire, you're really talking about consistency and habit. Another 
group of traits that we're not always so great at talking about today in the United States. No, we're really not. And, you know, I think Malcolm Gladwell said it takes 10,000 reps for something to become a habit. And, you know, you start to look at that and then you couple this with people not being taught how money works, right? We, we, we graduate and then we fumble our way through life making mistake after mistake. And so, you know, we, we've set out to try to correct that with our foundations, curriculum and personal finance that we teach in high schools and middle schools, because this money stuff is a lifelong tool. You'll either learn how to manage it or the money will manage you. So definitely as of the last bunch of years, especially with the good economic markets, there has been a community of people who have really grown up with this idea of early retirement. You see people talking about retirement in their late 20s, late 30s. Some people call it the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. What are your impressions? I'm sure you're reading this, seeing all the information. Is this a viable way to go about things? Or how does this connect to what you found when you looked at everyday millionaires? Yeah, I think, you know, anytime, obviously, intentionality, focus, goal setting, hardworking, you know, those are all attributes of the people that are in that movement. What I think, though, with that is that it talks a lot about hurrying up and being able to retire. I want people to retire to something, not from. And so what I mean by that is, what are you going to go do next? And so that's why even at my website, as I help people with the RIQ, the Retired Spark Quotient, to help them understand how much they're going to need, I start off with the dream first. I want to know what is it that gets you excited? Is it travel? Is it starting a business? Spending time with family? Because I want people to begin to envision this. And so to, to, to cut off not living so you can retire like 15 years sooner, I don't know how sustainable it is. Like, let's think, you're a doctor. You know about these fad diets and all this stuff, right? The What is it, the Atkins? Like, you could eat a side of beef, but you can't have one potato chip. Listen, people lose their minds, right? And so that's where we need that balance in there of living, but living intentionally. So I like the idea of people living their dreams, and I want them to do it soon, but I want them to understand their heart and what they're willing to do to get there. So if you're living intentionally, it's quite all right to slow down your path to millionaire status if you're still being careful, but want to go out and enjoy life and do some of those things that have real meaning to you. I I think it's imperative. I think once I, you know, I tell people, obviously, I want you to get out of debt super fast, right? I want you to shut down everything and get that, get that thief out of your life. But, you know, in the midst of you working this journey of building wealth, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint right? You can't put on sprinter spikes and get out there and sprint for 26.2 miles, right? You, the, you, the heart can't take it. So you have to pace yourself. And that means having some milestones that you celebrate, taking some vacations, being able to breathe a little bit, but at the same time, staying on the course, right? I don't want to do anything that puts me backwards. And so that's what a lot of people end up doing. In a sense, I get the feeling that if you go back to the baby steps, right, of getting yourself an emergency fund and out of debt, that once you make it through those first few steps, you put yourself in a lot better place and then can be more intentional about exactly how you get to that millionaire. Yes, sir, you can. You really can. I tell people, listen, you get yourself out of debt, you get your money back, right? You get that thief out of your life and you get a chance to get the boot off your throat. You can breathe a little bit. But I think we've seen throughout this pandemic, the absolute importance of uh, having an emergency fund in place. You know, it is, it is it's super important. And so I want to encourage your listeners as well to make sure you get that three to six months of money set aside and uh, gives you some cushion. You'll sleep better. Your relationships will feel better because you have that stress out of your life. You mentioned COVID and the pandemic. Everyday Millionaires was written before the COVID era. Has our current situation changed any of the message of your book? Is there anything that you feel needs to be added to the text just because times have changed? You know, I absolutely not. I thought about that. And if anything, as you thumb through the stories in the book of people that have come from abusive situations, homeless situations, overcome illnesses, family members' illnesses and loss, you see people that have had challenges in there. And I, I think anybody that expects to get through life without some challenges, well, they're, they're, they're in a dream world. Uh, life happens. Life is tough. It's going to be some challenges. But it's all a matter of how we respond. You know, you get so many people that want to lay down and whine, or you get people that want to get up and scrap. 
And I, I think if anything, this COVID situation is going to help us to see the people that are really, really focused versus the people that aren't. And hopefully more people will wake up. Hopefully this situation is jarring enough because we have corporations that have sent people home to work. You know, we've got 52 million people unemployed. And so people are going to have to start to think. They're going to have to do some things they weren't used to doing. And maybe this wakes up that fire inside of them to strive more than ever. Your outlook, however, is optimistic. It's very optimistic. Listen, we've been here with things like this before. I can't say we've been through this kind of pandemic, but let's talk about where we've been. If we go back into the Great Depression, we obviously know what we walked through there. Let's fast forward a little bit, right? We walked through Y2K. Remember when the world was going to shut down and, and, and nothing happened, right? I mean, it just didn't. The SARS epidemic in 02 and 03, where we had this severe kind of drop in the market, but it came back. And I can't forget the terrible day of 9-11 when we were attacked and what happened in the market, but it came back. My point is, is that although this is new, this is a major challenge. And I firmly believe it's going to come back. Let's look at the stock market right now, right? In February, things were flying high. March hits, the market drops. But here in the last two weeks, between the Dow and the S&P, things have not only come back, but they're better than where they were in February. We're still here in the middle of this pandemic. So the reality is, is this, the stock market is a roller coaster, right? The stock market is going to go on wild rides. You need to understand what you're investing in and you need to understand why it's important to you so you stay the course. The book is Everyday Millionaires. Chris Hogan, thank you for your optimistic outlook. I think it is exactly the medicine we need right now. Tell us what is up next in your life and if people want to interact with you more, where can they find you? Well, sure. Absolutely. Well, I am still doing the Chris Hogan show. They can find that at chrishogan360.com. Obviously doing a lot of webinars now. I can't travel and do speaking gigs. So doing webinars, you can reach me there as well. But chrishogan360.com is where you can find me. Yeah, I, like you, cannot wait until we can travel again because I'm a big fan of public speaking. And it just adds to my life to be out there speaking to an audience. And I can tell just from your demeanor that for you, too, that's a big part of, of what makes you happy. Absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to talking to you again. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Chris Hogan. That's a wrap. In a moment, we are going to celebrate two years of Earn and Invest. But before we do, I just wanted to give a shout out to WalletHacks.com. This is a website by my friend Jim Wang where you can go to demystify money. There are a bunch of great articles there. And best of all, it's free. Check them out at WalletHacks.com. That's W-A-L-L-E-T-H-A-C-K-S.com. And don't forget to sign up for their free newsletter. So we are here with one of my favorite people, Jennifer Ma, and we are celebrating two years of Earn and Invest. This podcast dropped in November of 2018. It was called the What's Up Next podcast at that time. My co-host was Paul Thompson. He has since left, and we are now Earn and Invest. This is a big celebration for me to stick to it for two years has been a big deal, and I've really enjoyed the journey. So I invited Jennifer Ma on to interview me about two years of podcasting. Jennifer, welcome back. Thank you so much for asking me. I am so honored, and this is an interview that is not pulling any punches, people. Stick with me, okay? I'm in trouble, aren't I? (laughs) Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Because that's what good friends do, right? And this is a conversation between good friends. So Doc, I am so proud of you. Two years. That's incredible. That's an incredible time to develop um, a style, a podcast that delivers content that's unusual with great interviews. I love your interview style. And before you think I'm going to be all nice to them, guys, hang in there. So, Doc, two years is a huge milestone. And in the middle of that, you had Paul leaving, who was your partner in crime. And sometimes when we start out on a journey with a partner and that partner fades away, or leaves for their own uh, projects and passions or whatever, and we're left left with uh, just ourselves, we could feel sort of bereft. Can you talk a little bit about that transition and what that meant to you and how uh, what you learned from that? What was the biggest challenge? 
Well, the transition meant everything in a few ways. One was that it was a journey that Paul and I both took together. And we had started this journey because we were fond of each other, right? We liked hanging out. We liked talking about personal finance. And then we built this thing together. And I was really proud of what we had built to that point. So first and foremost, there was definitely a sense of loss and mourning. No question about it. He was my partner in crime. We had really found this really nice balance of how we did different parts of the podcast. The other side was it was a chance for me to really develop my voice. So since he was leaving, I was at this juncture and I could take the podcast a little more towards where I wanted it to go. And so it was definitely an opportunity. There was the fear, the basic fear, because he was managing a lot of the technical aspects. I had never edited an episode. I had never put everything together. I had never uploaded it. Pretty much I was doing more of the planning each show and getting the guests and doing that kind of work. So that part was fearful. But the truth of the matter is I was excited, afraid, but excited that I could just continue to develop it. And the one thing I knew for sure is I was so happy with what it was that there was no way I was going to stop. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think it's really interesting how you just like jumped into learning the technical stuff. And that leads actually into a question from one of our favorite people, Eric Holston. He's part of the Earn and Invest community. By the way, did you guys know that there's an Earn and Invest community on Facebook, totally free, where we get to hang out with Doc? Just want to make sure you knew that. (laughs) Anyway, uh, Doc's laughing at me because I'm making funny faces. Um, Eric asks, what's a week or more in the production of an Earn and Invest podcast episode look like? What percentage of time on the podcast are you doing the work versus outsourcing? So I probably spend a good 20 to 30 hours a week on this podcast, but it's not continuous. So it's in little bites and pieces. I have two main helpers for this podcast. One is my son, Cameron. He does a lot of the editing, and I would say that he spends about three hours a week editing. And then, of course, you, Jennifer Ma, is helping me with social media, and you spend probably another two to four hours a week. So the bulk of what goes on is from me It's funny because I've now got this schedule going every week that I don't really think much about it. But if I was to look at the week, and let's see if I can get this without leaving parts out, right? So every Monday, I usually record an episode, which means that Sunday night, I had to study for a few hours to know the people that I'm going to record with. Then on Monday, I put together a list of questions. I plan out or at least think out my interview story. And I make sure I have all my bios together. So that's another good hour or two Monday morning. Before then I record, I usually record about 10 a.m. Central Time. Recordings take about an hour. So from 10 to 11, I am recording. And that's mostly what's going on Monday, as well as the episode dropping. That's our Monday episode. So I'm preparing for future episodes, but the Monday episode is dropping. So I'm on social media Jennifer, you've been really helpful with some of my posts, but I'm retweeting and paying attention and responding to what's going on with the episode that actually aired that day. By Tuesday, I am starting to put together my Thursday episode. So I send it to my son to edit it. He does what's called the first pass editing. I get it then after his first pass editing and I spend another hour and a half, two hours listening to it, getting rid of any last ums and uhs, making sure that the sound quality is good. After that, I have to arrange the episode. So I have the audio, which is just the person speaking, but then I have to put in music. I have to put in any advertisements and record any advertisements. All advertisements you hear actually recorded each and every show. I don't repeat any. Um, So, A lot of Tuesday is also spent arranging the episode for Thursday. By Wednesday, I'm actually starting to do the new listening and editing for the next Monday episode. But on top of that, I have to make sure that everything is ready for the Thursday drop. So I have to make sure that I've made up the web page and done the blog post for Thursday's episode that all my links are in place. I have to make sure that I have all my graphics both for the episode dropping on Thursday and I'm starting to make the graphics for the next Monday episode. By Thursday, then 
Thursday episode is dropping. And of course, I'm doing any social media stuff that needs to be done there. On Thursday, I'm also prepping for any Friday interviews. So I tend to do my second interview of the week on Fridays. So I am doing all that prep work, which is studying up on the people who are going to be on the show. And Friday is exact as Monday. Usually I spend an hour or two in the morning preparing for the interview. Then I do the interview itself and clean up anything extra for social media, getting ready for the weekend. And by the next Saturday, I'm already starting to prep the episode for the coming Thursday. So I'm already looking at the next week's episode. So as you can tell, it is a rolling schedule. I do it now so innately that I don't even really think about it anymore, but I'm continuously doing little bits and pieces every day for the podcast. What probably takes the most time is the actually preparing for each episode, both the night before and the day of. That's what I probably spend the most time on. And because I want to make sure that the interviews I do with people on my show are unlike any interviews you've heard anywhere else. So hopefully you listen to my episodes and it might be someone you've heard before, but my hope is to get them to talk about something that's deeply important to them, but that you haven't heard them speak on. Yeah, absolutely. And case in point was the recent episode with Paul Ollinger, which I adored. Um, very different uh, tone than I expected since he's known as a comedian. And uh, I really appreciated the insights. When I listen to your podcast, one of the things that always strikes me, Doc, is how personal you are. At the very beginning, when you open it with a vignette from your heart, from your soul, I feel like I get a little nugget of Doc all the time. And it is amazing to me that you, who have been anonymous at least for that first year, pseudo anonymous, um, you reveal so much of the inner workings of your heart and your soul and your brain. I wonder if you're fully comfortable with what you're revealing. And I'm in awe of that authenticity. When you are scheduling your interviews, are you thinking of a story you want to tell? Is it the guest inspires the story or are you thinking of a story and that inspires the guest? Maybe this is a chicken and egg question, but I love those little vignettes of you, both at the very beginning and at the end. They're super special. So what you have to know about me is I am at heart a storyteller. If you ask me what I did for a living, it was being a physician. But if you ask me what my true love is, it's storytelling. And that's why I fell into blogging and public speaking and podcasting. When I choose someone for an episode, it's one of two reasons. Either I see something that I put out that is just interesting to me, that it's different, that it adds something to the conversation I haven't seen before, or it's a person that I just truly respect and feel and want to get their voice out. But by that point, I usually don't have a story in mind. When the story happens is that night before, when I go through all my guests and put together what I think is going to be the show, I really vibe off of them. I want my stories to reflect the lens at which I'm creating the story and I can't create that lens until I read up on everyone and know what topic I want to jump into. Once I do that, I then go back to my own life and say, well, how do I approach this idea? What story can I tell that gives you a feeling for the lens that I'm viewing these people in? Because it really sets the tone for the show. And what most people don't realize is I tell these stories live to my guests during the recording. So almost none of these stories are ever recorded after the episode. They're all done before. And I don't write down the words or script them anymore. I think about the general idea. I practice in my head what I want to say, but they're mostly off the cuff. I, I really do appreciate the extemporaneous style. It feels so much more immediate and so authentic because it's in the moment. And I want my, I want my, panelists to feel that because I think one mistake we make as podcasters is we invite people into the show and we don't warm them up at all. We just kind of throw them in and start, you know, throwing questions at them. My idea is I want to invite them into the show, warm up the mic, so to speak, and give them that lens that I see the world through so that they can at least figure where I'm coming from. And what I found is if I do my research really well and get to know the people really well, 
that story tends to bring out their stories more. Absolutely. I think it it's almost as if you two are exchanging insights into each other and therefore it opens up that door. It's sort of like, I trust you with this little aspect of me. And that creates that environment where they're willing to open up to you too. And I love that because it's a much more intimate exchange in that sense. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that you don't want to actually interview these people and have the same old tropes or the same old themes come up. Does that mean that you're listening to other podcasts? I listen to other podcasts all the time. My consumption has gone down significantly because I am producing so much that I don't know if I have always the emotional energy, but I try to stay up to date on my favorites. Certainly since I also work on Stacking Benjamins, I'm always listening to them. When I have a person on, I'll go back and listen to the recent podcast episodes that other people have done, or if they are a podcast producer themselves, I'll listen to a few of their episodes too. So I'm continuously consuming. I am not always doing it the way I did before I was so much of a producer. Before I would kind of religiously go to the same podcast or the same blog all the time. And I don't have, unfortunately, as much energy to do that as I used to. No, I think the bandwidth, you know, tightens up as you're creating your creative energy and the emotional energy you're putting out there. Everything is sort of like birthing a new episode is, is, is a process. So it takes a lot of energy. Um, okay. So they had some really funny questions and Eric wants to go on and ask you, um, what are you doing for exercise? Are you doing anything for fun? And of course, he wanted to ask you all the cybersecurity questions, which I laughed at. <laughs> What's your mother's maiden name? Let's not do that, though. Okay, Doc? I do. I, I'm a big fan of exercise. I used to be a big workout junkie. And I remember, especially when I was in my 20s, I got like really muscular and I was bench pressing tons and squatting and doing all this stuff. I've really moved away from that. I am now a fan of continuous motion. So I'm 47 years old and I feel like I have to be moving all day long. So I tend to wake up about 4.45 every morning. And one of the first things I do is about 30 minutes of the Stairmaster. And then I'll stretch and do push-ups and things like that for another 20 minutes. And that's like the beginning of my day. And I'll usually, with my wife, go take either a long run or a walk for another few miles every day. Um, and on top of that, I'll just, you know, we try to make movement part of almost everything we do. So I'm up and out the door. When it's nice weather out, I'm out walking every morning too. So usually I'll do my morning workout. And on a lot of days, I'll go take a walk by the lake because I live right by Lake Michigan. Um, oh, that's so cool. But I don't go to gyms anymore. I used to when I was younger. I don't go to gyms anymore. I don't do really weights anymore. Any Anything muscular work I do, I do with my body weight. So we do a lot of planking and things like that. Oh, uh, cool. But I would consider myself a fairly active person. Yeah, it's just not regimented to the gym and a gym fanatic type. Although I have to say, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't ask for a pick or it didn't happen. <laughs> your, from your from your very gym devotee days. So yeah. I feel like for the community, I have to ask, well, would you ever share a pic of that? I, you I'm know? trying to think if I have a good one. <laughs> I am now, I weigh something like, let me think, I probably weigh about 155 pounds. I was about 185 pounds a few years wow. ago. So I lost a lot of weight, but I was, there was a time when I was really, you know, I think I was up to 185 pounds and I was bench pressing about 250, 275 pounds and squatting a few hundred pounds. And I was, I was awesome. working out pretty heavily, but it, you know, I, I don't know what happened in life, but I got to that point where I used to strive and push myself physically and it would exhaust me emotionally and mentally. And now I realize to be healthy, I don't have to push that hard on the physicality and I'd rather spend the emotional time pushing on something like making the podcast, doing something that has real deep spiritual meaning for me. I love exercising, but I've lost that drive to push myself so hard physically. Now it's more about sustained exercise to me. Like I want to be very healthy. Like I want to, you know, walk five to 10 miles a day. I want to continuously keep myself moving. No, I think that's great. You know, um, in terms of rejuvenating yourself, you know, those walks in the morning. I have to admit, I'm flabbergasted at 445 in the morning. Yikes. Um, <laughs> so are you doing a lot of reading um, on your off time? What, what, what kind of hobbies rejuvenate you? Um, I know that you're focusing so much on the podcast and you have a wonderful family. So what else uh, are you doing in your free time or do you not have any? 
so I read, read tons. I mean, I read two to three books a week, yeah, probably two books a week. Um, as well as I exercise quite a bit and meditate and write. And that's mostly it. I mean, you know, my son just got his driver's license. So we were driving quite a bit, like two to three days a week, we were going out and driving for an hour a day. And so the kids, besides the kids, usually that's enough. I like to do a lot of public speaking. Um, so I work on getting public speaking gigs and practice those too. So between all of that, I stay pretty busy. I also, I mean, I love watching TV. Like at seven o'clock in our house, my wife and I are slumped in front of the TV, happy as can be watching whatever's on. I can't, well, one, I can't imagine you not in motion. That's sort of (laughs) funny. I know that sounds really weird, but if you have never met Doc, there is something energetic about him that, you know, just comes through. It's not like a frenetic energy at all. It's calm and soothing, but he's like in motion. He's expressive. Um, so it, watch watch the video clips he has posted on his website. I, I think you'll find it amazing. Now, um, so that begs the question, what, what are you reading right now? So I read pretty much two different things. I've mostly stopped reading personal finance books because I feel like after reading a number of them, I just got everything I needed to. But because I'm constantly interviewing people on my podcast, I'm often reading their books. So for instance, Kate Flanders just put out a book about opting out. And I just read that recently. I have a friend who just wrote a book about hospice. So I'm reading her book. But really what I tend to read otherwise is much more pleasure reading. So You know, I just, for instance, so I used to go to the library all the time and every day we'd pick up two or three, every week we'd pick up two or three books. I'd read them, return them, et cetera. Since we're not going out as much because of COVID, I'm using the app on my phone for our local library. So for instance, I just downloaded George R.R. Martin, Fire and Blood. Woohoo. Okay. He's in my lane now. (laughs) I just finished like Terry Brooks's 15 book saga, the Shannara series. So like, I love fantasy. I'm a big fan. So in my reading life, I'm a big fan of these stories where the average person finds out they have magic powers and saves the world. I mean, that makes me happy. It's the Lord of the Rings over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. But I... I like that escapism. And while I don't feel it's the reality of our world, it provides entertainment and solace. And so I will go through those books like there's no tomorrow. I'll just read, oh, read, read. Absolutely. I love those too. It's the idea that you or the thing that moves me is that the individual has some capability to impact the world so positively. Did you ever read Lord Fowl's Bane by Stephen Donaldson? In that series, the Thomas Covenant series? I read all of the time. That was one of the first of my more recent reads, like probably five years ago. I read them, every single one of them. I read them very quickly. And they're that, those are great books. They're tough reads, though. That is not, those are not easy reads. The characters are not always per se likable, um, no. but it's a wonderful series. Yeah. In your position life, you were known as a speaker, um, a writer already, um, and then you've moved over to podcasts and you have another fan following. What's it feel like to have two different followings and have they converged at all for you? So they've converged a little bit. Um, the Financial Independence Retire Early movement has a certain number of doctors involved with it. So I first got involved in financial independence and personal finance because of my physician blog, because a blogger named or a writer named Jim Dolly wanted me to review his book, The White Coat Investor. So that's how my worlds collided. Um, They're not exactly the same audience, but they're not that far off. And there's certainly lots of crossovers. So they do collide from time to time. Since I moved into personal finance, I haven't really cultivated my physician following as much. So I blogged about medicine from about 2005 to 2018. And I kind of, as I moved away from writing about medicine as much, I moved away from that audience. So I haven't done much to maintain it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really feel like my my niche now is personal finance writing, but I do it from a doctor's perspective. Well, I think you do it from a many faceted perspective. I mean, there's so many different aspects of who you are as a person that influence your interview style. Um, I'm going to go back to that doctor question. You know, one of the things that always strikes me about 
content creators. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm always in awe of them is how much of themselves they reveal. And um, I grew up where I thought work had to be work and, and personal life and these revelations of who you are as an, as a person, the flaws, the, the internal machinations and thoughts that you, you just keep diving through that internal thinking process. That's all reserved to your private life. And here I look at you and I'm thinking, wow, he's got a professional persona that's out there that everyone knows. And he has this other persona that is also professional, but much more intimate in my opinion, in the personal finance space and that convergence. And the reason why I asked that was that, uh, do you feel like some of that hesitation to, to cultivate the doctor, uh, audience or following is because you still want to keep that separation or do you have any qualms about that? I don't think so. So my doctor persona and my blog I wrote about medicine was exceedingly vulnerable and personal. So I wrote about the toughest, hardest parts about being a doctor and it was very open and I used my real name, which I actually don't in personal finance. So in a way that was a very, very personal blog and it was a personal connection to the community I had built. The truth of the matter is, as I've moved forward in my life, I realized that I just don't connect with that identity of being a physician nearly as much as I used to. And it never fit me really well. I mean, I look back on my life as a physician and sometimes it was reluctant. It wasn't reluctant to go into the field, but the social aspect always was reluctant. I didn't really have lots of doctor friends. I didn't hang out where doctors hang out. I didn't act like doctors. Like my wife always laughs at me. I am the last one to tell anyone what I do for a living. In fact, we go to parties and I'm always trying to hide what I do for a living because it's so much easier not to say that you're a doctor. Once you say you're a doctor, you get this litany of questions about being a doctor and people stop seeing you as an individual and start seeing you as an avatar. And... <laughs> I think part of moving to where I've moved today is because I just didn't connect with that identity anymore. And even my persona in personal finance, I use the moniker Doc G more because when I started writing, I was writing very intimately about personal finances. And as still a practicing physician, it's kind of dangerous to connect your finances to your real name. I mean, there are a lot of problems that can befall you by having that information out, as well as my wife wasn't so excited about having her people at her work know the intimacies of our of our finances either. So I don't have a real problem. I, I'm one of those people who believes that vulnerability and seek, well, I should say this another way. I think secrets damage you and the way you get away from being damaged by secrets is you don't have any. So I always thought that if I let people know exactly who I am, my worries and fears, as well as my triumphs, and I owned them and I was comfortable with them, they're not really going to hurt me. And so I don't have a real problem with vulnerability because this is who I am. You either like me or you don't like me, but I have a hard time finding that you're going to be able to use it against me. Yeah. You know, I actually am embracing that now more so in the sense that um, the more I shine bright lights on the things that I think are shameful about my past and my history or whatever, the you know, take me as I am and flawed or not. Um, you know, my friends who stay are my friends. And if you want to work with me, then this is who I, I truly am. But I think it's gotten, I think personal finance and that pursuit of financial independence helped me with my journey. And I can't help but think that um, there are people out there who are still trying to separate their personal and their professional life, that embracing of themselves and all, all its glory so what would you tell someone who is struggling with just being embracing their their shame? I mean, we, there are so many aspects about how shame is so harmful in our society, right? And in terms of the persona uh, from, from a personal perspective, right? It stops growth. It prevents all sorts of things. We feel like it can be used against us. So what would you tell someone who is struggling with with shining that bright light on themselves and saying, this is who I am? So- I tell you that most of the time, people are so busy looking at their own flaws that they just don't notice yours. So you can be as out and open with who you are as you want. And most people are so wrapped up in their own issues, they're not even paying attention to you. When you have shame, it's a very internal feeling. 
which means what that is telling you is I have a part of me that I'm not comfortable with, not that the world isn't comfortable with, but that I'm not comfortable with. So it's really a process of you coming to terms with your bad feelings about yourself. We all have them. I have shame about things or have had in the past. It's just a matter of I think you have to try to come to terms with them when you feel comfortable with your own vulnerability and your own blemishes. It doesn't really matter what everyone else thinks. No. And I, and to add to that, I really do think if I, that pursuit of it helped me because it's sort of like the farther away you get dependent on a W2 employer or being employed or looking at employment in in a particular lens where it's a one direction type of arrangement that um, you're able to just say, this is who I am. And I've done that in every interview I've ever had. I'm like, this is who I am. If you're asking for a yes person, that's not who you're going to (laughs) get. And financial independence is about empowerment. And when you find your power, when it comes to your money, it doesn't just stay with your money. It starts spilling over to those other parts of yourself. When you realize I am powerful, I can control my destiny, it feels really good and helps you deal with those other parts of yourself you're not as comfortable with. Yeah. So I'm going to veer back to what your fans and followers wanted to ask. I thought this was a great question from Claudia Scott. Do you still budget? What fintech do you use? And above all else, how do you talk to your kids about money? And how do you give them what they need without spoiling them? So first and foremost, do I still budget? I don't know if I ever really budgeted. Our first form of budgeting was saving one of our incomes, right? So when we first started working, I think I had a lower income than my wife because I was a resident. So we lived off of my income and saved her income. After, After we got done with residency, I started making more. So then we saved her income. Mm -hmm. Uh, As I go farther and farther, I've developed good spending habits. So I don't pay attention to the line by line budget, but I know what I'm comfortable and not comfortable spending and buying. So it almost naturally budgets yourself without paying attention to the specifics. And that's how I've always done it. I did use Mint and Personal Capital for a while. I really don't use much FinTech anymore. I mean, I use QuickBooks for my work stuff, but otherwise... I'm the kind of guy who does most things in my head. (laughs) I don't write much down. It's really bad. Uh, But that's how I pay attention to most things. The question about the kids is an interesting one. What we decided with our kids is that A, we'll teach by example, right? So we're going to model good behavior by spending reasonably and by not being frivolous. B, we decided that instead of giving them a weekly allowance, we give them a yearly allowance that they get on January 1st. And that yearly allowance has to pay for certain things that they need, like clothes. And we don't make them pay for their own meals, but if they want to buy candy or extras, they have to pay for it. We pay for school supplies, but pretty much they're supposed to cover everything else. So they have that amount at the beginning of the year, and then it is up to them to figure it out for the rest of the year and budget, and we expect them to save a little bit too. And so the idea is that they can use trial and error. There's a perfect example. My son had his money saved away, spent a bunch of it, and then he dropped his phone in the lake. And all of a sudden, he needed a new phone and had no money left over because he hadn't left enough in savings. So That's what we started with our kids, I think, when they turned around 10 or 11, and we've tried to do it ever since. As they've gotten older, they've actually found ways also to make money. So the idea is you create a framework in which they can fail safely, but that gives them some freedom to have some trial and error on their own. You know, I love that because when it's a great time to try stuff out, fail within the the safety of your household, right? So you started at a 10, you gave them a set amount. And uh, they're expected to manage it. That's pretty nifty. Yeah, I think there are three ways to teach children about money. You can model good behavior, and I think that's very strong. Your kids are going to see what you do, right? You can teach them didactically, but unfortunately, teaching them didactically, meaning sitting down and explaining what compound interest and all that, probably doesn't stick very much. And then the last is give them trial and error, right? So they can have a safe place to use trial and error and fail, and that's... uh, probably as beneficial as modeling. So of the three ways, didactic teaching actually, I think does them the least, whereas modeling and trial and error probably are the best. Yeah, no, I I think that's a really great model. I think that's terrific. As an auntie, 
uh, I'll have to think about how I can help with all of that. Okay, so, you know, Doc, everyone wants to talk about healthcare. You know, it's a big factor in financial independence and what do early retirees do who aren't qualified for Medicare. Um, So Robert Chase would like to know, how would you propose improving palliative care and or healthcare in general? It's such a frustration for early retirees. Palliative care actually is improving quite a bit. In fact, if you look back compared to 10 or 15 years ago, we have much more hospice and palliative care awareness than there ever was. I think right now the biggest part with palliative care is education and acceptance. So what we really need to do is educate people on what palliative care is and what hospice is and when you qualify for both. And I think the biggest part is getting people to know what it is and how it's available. Healthcare itself is obviously a quandary. I think we have a very changing and expanding healthcare system. I assume that the solutions will eventually be either some type of government covered healthcare or some type of high deductible plan where everyone gets a certain level of healthcare and then you either pay out of pocket or buy yourself secondary insurance to cover some of the other costs. And I think that's the only way it can work. We Healthcare is expensive and it's always going to be expensive. I think we have to kind of get rid of a lot of the administrative costs. I do think we have to give patients as well as caregivers, physicians, therapists, nurses, et cetera. I think they all have to have some skin in the game. But how to make that happen and how to make it happen well is is very difficult. Hmm. If you were approached by a political organization to help sort of be part of the think tank for that, would you say yes? I don't know if that's where my passion is anymore. I really yeah. have to tell you, like, and I don't even know if it's where my expertise is. I think I know a lot about healthcare, but Right now, I'd rather focus on what we're doing. If I had a pile of extra time and money on my hands, I would probably work on making Earn and Invest a better podcast. I think it's a great podcast. (laughs) Can always improve. I'd add more. Well, yes. I mean, there's lots of things that we could add that we want more of. More doc. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There's lots of things that we could ask for. Um, One of the things I'm trying to figure out is how to get your... um, role model for podcasting and interviewing into your studio and trying to figure out how do we get a grassroots movement to get Terry Gross on air with you? I think that would be incredibly cool. As I've said (laughs) before on the podcast, I think she is an amazing interviewer and I know exactly how I'd want to interview her. Like I have it in my brain already, exactly what kind of questions I want to ask. Um, I just find it incredibly fascinating And I'm really excited that there's someone that I can really look up to and say, okay, this is how I want to conduct myself when I am behind the mic. And so it's been a joy to listen to her and and it's been really instructive. The other thing that's funny that I, I tell people all the time is she also made me realize that I don't have to be perfect. Like when I listen to her on Fresh Air, I listen to her podcast, you know, she doesn't do everything 100% perfectly. And I often try to hold myself to that standard so that when I'm listening to my playback of my recording, you know, I don't like when I mess the sentence up or I said this wrong or I didn't do this part. And when I hear that she occasionally makes mistakes or at least doesn't say things 100% perfectly clear either, and that adds to the recording as opposed to taking it away, it's allowed me to relax a little bit and try to just be more myself on the recordings than try to be perfection. I'm really glad about that. I really am. It's easier to connect with people over our imperfections. It's much more comfortable and it's much more real than to be perfect all the time. It's so intimidating to appear to be perfect. And um, I think that your audience, you know, we just enjoy you the way you are. So I'm glad that's helped you relax. So if Terry Gross were here and she was interviewing you, what do you think she'd ask? What would she ask me? Uh Uh-huh. You know her style. I think, I think she'd ask me, I don't know. I think she'd ask me why, why do I do all this? I mean, I think that's the big question. Like why show up every day? Why get behind the mic? Why leave medicine to live this life? Okay. And why doc? Because you're a storyteller, a creator. Why? 
because because I have a deep need to connect and communicate. And I think that's the reality of it. And believe it or not, while I have lots of friends, I think I need sometimes to communicate and connect almost in one direction. Like, I don't mind that it's me being vulnerable in front of a mic, putting my voice out into the ether. That doesn't bother me. But I feel that deep need to be part of that conversation. I think that's great. Anna Kiss would like to know more about your journey now. Uh, she's She says, I've only delved into in a little since Camp Mustache, where that was my first exposure to him. I did listen to a recent podcast of his recording the time to dump city living, which gave me good insight to him. With this whole pandemic world, I don't have the mental energy to find the info I'd like to know. So let's talk a little bit about your journey. You know, this last year, this is the second year of your anniversary. Let's talk about your journey from from the beginning to now. What has surprised you the most on becoming a podcast and content creator? and putting yourself out there in the financial independent space? There are a few things that have surprised me. or not surprised me, but really enriched the experience. The first is how deep these conversations can go and how people give you access to their lives. I've used the excuse of the podcast to call on people who have no reason to talk to me, who are busy and quote unquote famous and have other things to do, and have had the ability to get them in front of my mic and ask them whatever I want for 30 minutes or an hour. And that's amazingly surprising. I'll tell you, if you ever want an excuse to approach all those people that you respect, just get a podcast. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad, but it gives you that reason. My journey has been interesting because it has changed. You know, I can look at the first year recording with Paul and kind of separate that from the second year where I got involved with Joe Salcihai from Stagging Benjamins. And Joe has really taught me much more about the art of podcasting. So I had this idea of how to interview people. And I think that was always my skill is I could get people in the room and ask them good questions. But I knew nothing about how to create something that was appealing to the ear from the moment it started to the moment it ended. And he also was so great at teaching me about community building. So a lot of what I've learned about how to make Earn and Invest better has come from working with Joe from Stacking Benjamins. And he's just, he's taught me all these great things that have really made it a much more full story of me and what I'm trying to get out into the world. And I just didn't understand that before. I didn't realize that a podcast essentially is about the podcast creator. We bring in guests and people we think that are of interest. But what really you're doing, what ties the narrative together episode after episode is that podcast creator or narrator. And I, I'd never thought about that until this year. Yeah. And, um, you know, Joe owes you like 20 bucks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He's not. He, Joe is an incredible entertainer and educator. He would hate that I said educator, but um, I think he is incredibly funny and I'm so glad you're partnered with him. Um, is there an episode of Earn and Invest or What's Up Next in its earlier car- incarnation that you wish you could redo that it didn't turn out the way you wanted? So my biggest episode that blew up in my face was the episode with Sam from Financial Samurai, the one that I never released. Oh, Um, yes, I remember. And that was quite controversial because a lot of people in our community just weren't ready to have his message on the podcast at that time. Uh, And I've dealt with that controversy before, but it also was hard because I felt like it was an episode that had a lot of good things to say. So I decided not to run it based on our community response and the fact that I didn't feel like I was fulfilling the needs of my community if I was putting things out there that made them feel uncomfortable. But I wish I could do that again in such a way that I could take the essence of what was good out of that recording and still get it out there without causing harm to my community or furthering a voice that my community at least wasn't ready to hear more from. Interesting. That's a good point. You know, that's, um, I have to admit as, as a member of your community, I'm sort of glad that you didn't put that, 
that podcast out. Is there an episode of Earn Invest that you're like, this, this is my favorite episode. This is an awesome episode that that you wish everyone else had heard, um, that you'd like all of us, if we haven't heard it, to go back and listen. I hate to say it, but I try to feel that way after every episode. Like every episode, I really want to feel like we really hit it out the park. I'll tell you, in the early days of the podcast, we did an episode. This was in November, December of 2018. No, it was, I think it was maybe February, March of 2019. We did an episode about being African American in the financial independence community. And that was one of the first episodes where I took a subject that was innately uncomfortable to me as a white male. And I said, I, we are going to make our show into the kind of show that has these conversations. And I'm really proud of the fact that we were willing to go into it, both Paul and I, knowing that we may do this completely wrong. It may blow up in our faces. We may have either a horrible conversation or God forbid, we hurt people's feelings by being insensitive. But it was a conversation that was so innately important to me personally that that episode emotionally was very important to me to put out. On top of that, the people who were on the episode, the panelists were amazing and said just amazing, amazing things. So I think it was a great episode for the content. I also, it has a special meaning to me because it was one that I emotionally struggled with. And I had asked many people to be on it, actually, a number of people. And I had gotten some negative feedback from the people that I asked to be on it. Like, yeah, I really want to go on that episode. Um, so, so it felt really good that it turned out and it had meaning. And I felt like after recording it that it had meaning. And it certainly, I think, had meaning to those of us who are in on the conversation. And I hope it had meaning to the people listening, too, because it really meant a lot to me. Yeah, I remember that podcast episode, and I was trying to figure out which number that was. Episode 24. You know, one of the neatest things about that episode is um, creating that space for that discussion. And it is an important discussion. And I appreciated hearing it. And I thought you did a terrific job at creating an atmosphere where people could discuss this. And one of the things that I'm, I'm reminded of, because I'm actually a Brene Brown fan, um, is that it's okay to show up imperfectly, but show up and acknowledge that we're imperfect and that we're learning. And I'm and and the mantra that I'm trying to live by is pretty much that I'm not here to be right. I'm here to learn and and be better every single day. I'm here to learn and be better every single day. And so I I'm I'm so glad you tackled that topic. That was one of those episodes and I didn't record it or we didn't release it. But before that episode, I knew coming into this episode that this was going to be emotionally difficult, right? So you had me and Paul Thompson, two white guys with four black guests talking about what innately is just a really hard conversation. So I told a story to my guests before this that we didn't, we didn't put out, but it was a personal story about my dealings with an African-American patient who lived blocks away from me and died. And I went to the funeral and it was a historically black church. And I was the only white person in about 500 people there mourning this person's death. And as I looked out at the crowd and they were laughing and crying and celebrating this person's life, it really hit me how there are these communities all around us and that, we don't even pay attention to them or notice them. And yet they're there and they're important. And so I explained to the guests how I grew from this experience because it made me realize to be a better doctor and father and community member, I had to start opening my eyes to those communities around me that don't look like me because it's just not something we normally do. And so I use that as a prelude to start this conversation and I think telling that story, which is part of why now I tell the stories and record them and put them in the episodes, is it allowed 
the guest to see the view that was coming from my head and to see its authenticity. And I think that allowed for a much more comfortable, safer conversation when they knew exactly where I was coming from. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's important for all of us to see and recognize the communities that are vibrant around us and to really understand each other, you know, and I think that that conversation came from a place of, of learning and um, just trying to understand each other and foster that, that community. So no, I, I totally get it. So episode 24 guys, let's go back and re-listen to that. You know, as we're on our personal finance journeys, it's really super easy to get stuck in our myopic narrow world, especially with COVID having us shut in. So maybe this would be a nice way to expand it, but I love these conversations that are just a little bit different and a little bit more challenging. And I think you tackle it with grace. In fact, you are always, and Carrie, Carrie actually agrees with me. You are always calm, cool, and collected. When aren't you? Is there something that just is a button that pushes you over the edge? <laughs> is there a hot topic? You know, occasionally. Um, my poor wife probably sees them more than ever, not towards her, but towards other things, because she's the one I'll talk to and say, oh, this is really bothering me. But, you know, I don't think I get real riled up about things the way I used to when I was younger. I get passionate about things, but I've really, I've most of my life not been a very angry person. I've tried to dispense of that emotion because it just doesn't do much. Like you don't get much done by being angry. And I think I have an acceptance of, of the way the world is with a hope to change it for the better. So I mostly, I think, calm, cool, and collected. Yeah, not, not a lot of times recently. I can think of one or two things that my wife and I were getting heated over that had to do with our schools and whether they opened up or not. And that was kind of bothering me. But generally, no, I'm, I'm pretty calm most of the time. Oh, pretty cool. I love it. Of course, you know, that that makes me want to ask, will she ever be on the podcast? Can we meet her? I If she is ever ready for it, she has been offered multiple times if she ever is ready for it. But I think she's also a private person and likes keeping her lives separate. No, and I can understand that. And I'm so glad that you respect that. What do you think she would say about your podcast journey? I think she would say that this is very typical me. <laughs> so she's obviously watched the different incarnations of me through the years. And this is very on brand for who I am. I kind of throw myself into passion projects and I like to create. And so I've kind of done that throughout our relationship. So I don't think this surprises her. It's just kind of who I am. And, and she knows that. So uh, it doesn't surprise her very much. So, Doc, what was your creative project or passion project prior to your blog? So I wrote a blog about medicine from 2005 to 2018. I used that blog to self-publish two books. Um, before that, I sold artwork on the internet. So I did that oh, for a few yeah. years. And that was really my passion project where I set up a website and found ways to get artwork for cheap and then sell it. I've always been writing. I mean, writing poetry. I had a chat book of poetry published by a small publisher. So Ooh. I've always had kind of these things going on in my life. So on that note, do you think you're going to be developing an earn and invest YouTube channel and using your interviews? Because I know having been a guest on your show that we use um, a video mechanism to record and, and play off of each other and chat. Do you think there's going to be a a YouTube channel that's Earn and Invest and we get to see the outtakes? So there is an Earn and Invest YouTube channel already and the episodes are posting as audio only at the moment. I haven't put much up there yet. I think at some point we will have more video. I have the video stock. It's just more been a time of getting it together and editing it, editing it to make it appropriate. Because I start the record button like at the way beginning when people are first coming onto the Zoom call because I like to catch all the banter before. That's great for doing like outtakes and fun things for the podcast, but it's kind of a 
large file that maybe not everyone wants to see all the boring banter before the show starts on YouTube. Dylan Rhodes writes, I'd like to know more about his actual work growing of income. How has it evolved over time? We've heard more high level details, uh, but would like a little bit more of the actual mechanics. And I, I think I remember some of the high level details, but I don't know any of your mechanics. Yeah, my income has actually devolved over time, right? Because (laughs) when I was an active practicing physician at the height of my practice, I had a very, very high income. As I realized I was financially independent, I actually pulled those strings, getting rid of things I didn't like, which were some of the highest producing. But I also didn't have to worry about that because I had investments and real estate that were creating income for me. So my net worth tends to rise even if my income has dropped significantly. And that's because once you have enough money, it starts compounding and working for you. So I have stocks and bonds that throw off dividends. And so that's a form of income I have. I have real estate. I own four condo units that I rent out and they throw off a yearly payment that goes right into my cash fund. I still work as a hospice physician about 12 hours a week which provides some income. And my wife has decided not to yet leave her job. So she is still working a very full-time job in human resources. So between all that, we make a lot less income than I did five years ago, but it's certainly enough to live on given the fact that we're pretty much financially independent. It's That's part of the reason I don't think much about budgeting because we still have income coming in, even though our investments should mostly pay for whatever we need. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you're getting health insurance then through your wife's company. Correct. Ah, so that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So second year, what do you have in, this is the second year anniversary of your podcast. What do you envision and what do you want for year three? Year three is going to be even more great panelists, more great guests. We're probably going to venture slowly away from just financial independence to more broad personal finance and to just human interests. So I think some of the conversations we have on Earn and Invest don't have to be centered 100% on finance. I think they can touch on finance, but I want them also to touch on life. I think we may have some more video content I'm going to continue on trying to make the episodes fun and more entertaining and most importantly, bringing you the community in because this is your podcast. I've always said that when we started, I wanted this to be a community podcast and I want all of you to feel involved. So I want you to be able to hear your name in the guest segments. I want to discuss your issues. We actually have SpeakPipe on the Earn and Invest website, and no one has left us any speak pipe messages. So please, I'd love to discuss what your questions are, or what you have on your mind on the podcast, but I can't do it unless you leave me a voicemail. So go to earnandinvest.com, look for speak pipe. Otherwise, if you guys want this to continue to grow, tell your friends about it. The more people I have listened the more advertisers, sponsors, things I can use to make the podcast better and to bring you more and to have people like Jennifer here help me more, make this the greatest show it can be. But the key is that, you know, I am going to plug forward, but most importantly, I want to get you, the community involved. Wow. I have to admit, I'm a little ashamed to say that I did not know there was a speak pipe, guys. So let's let's leave Doc a whole bunch of really great messages from congratulations on his second year, best wishes for the third year and more. And then let's ask him some questions. And one of the things that he always says is, you know, this is a community-driven podcast. And um, even in his Earn and Invest group, he posts articles all the time that spurs incredibly interesting discussions. And sometimes I'm surprised at uh, the pivots it takes, but it's always enlightening. So if you haven't joined the community yet, I encourage you to do so because it's a different take. Um, He doesn't shy away from different topics. And that's one of the nicest things about the community. And you'll see some familiar people. I'm in that group too. (laughs) 
<laughs> and it's facebook.com slash groups slash earn and invest. Awesome. Or you can go to earn and invest.com. I've also started using some of my blog posts there. So we have video on earn and invest.com. We have blog posts as well as episode pages. So come see the site. You can leave a speak pipe. If I get enough voice messages, we will start doing listener question sections either as full episodes or at least as separate segments on the show. So if I can get enough interest, if people will leave us their questions, I will start answering them on the podcast and putting your name out there if you want. You know, Doc, I feel so bad. I had one last question for you and I almost forgot. You've got earn and invest and you've got diversify. Are you going to maintain both brands? Eventually, Diversify will fold into Earn and Invest. I'm already starting to slowly migrate the blog posts and things over. So Diversify right now is more a place to house some of the old episodes, et cetera. Uh, But I will move it over slowly because there's so many, so many, so many blog posts over there. And I don't want to drop them all at once. Well, I'm super glad as a listener that you're not going to hang up your mic and headphones and move off into the sunset. So I hope we'll remain your passion project for many, many years to come. And thank you for letting me take over and turn the mic on you for once. Thanks for asking the great questions.